Okay. So tonight we are doing Digital Public Library of America, and it's just a free database that you can access on your computer. Um, and it, we're going to go through a tour of it tonight. Um, I'm Amanda. I'm a library assistant at Middleton Public Library, and I usually do most of the adult uh, classes here, um, virtually and when we were all in the library. Hopefully, um, we'll be able to get to that point soon. Um, but Without further ado, we will continue onward with this. Okay. So, Digital Public Library of America, or as I like to call it, DPLA, is a database that brings together different collections from museums and libraries together into a single platform. And it's a portal that's open and just kind of coherent to um, digitize culture. So it provides books, images, historical records, and audiovisual materials. So this is all accessible to you for free. Why would we use it? So the biggest thing is that it's free. Um, libraries all over come together so that you can access things that you wouldn't necessarily be able to because of your current location. Um, and there's also items from places like Smithsonian, um, Library of Congress, and New York Public Library. All of those um, different places have a robust collection of historical items that us in Wisconsin here wouldn't necessarily be able to see unless we would go visit. And it's very obvious that right now there is not as much traveling going on. So this is a database that is ripe for us to be able to use right now uh, in whatever way we see fit. So we can use it for primary and secondary education resources uh, for families, genealogy, state or city history, uh, teaching guides for teachers, and for your own academic research. Um, whether you're a student or not, um, or a lifelong learning student, um, it's always super helpful. So the place that you go to access this is just dp.la. That's what you need to type in for the address. Uh, you can also Google dpla and it should pop up as well as your first search result. Uh, the great thing about DPLA is you do not need to sign up for anything. Uh, you don't have a need a library card or anything. Um, the only thing is, is that if you want to make lists to go back to, you have to use the same browser. Um, because when you create your lists, it's remembering um, what browser in your browser settings. It kind of connects with that. But otherwise, there's nothing you need to do other than access it through the same thing every time. So I'm going to go through here and show what it looks like on the website. Um, but again, after I get through the PowerPoint, I'm going to show you on my computer screen uh, live all the stuff that we're looking at. So don't worry if you feel a little overwhelmed. Um, the biggest thing that you use this for is searching because it is a database. It's just a database full of resources. So here I use, um, at the top of the home screen, there's always a search bar. Um, and I search by the word libraries. And it gave me a very large list here. And for each record, it gives you an author, a title, possibly a date. And some of them might have previews, some of them might not. So here are the first two records, it looks like um, did not show the picture in the preview. Uh, you also have these limiters here on the left side that will really help your search be less overwhelming because uh, you can narrow it back down by the type of item. So, you know, is it an image that you're looking for, sound image, the subject, 
um, you know, it'll go libraries. Um, what do they have there? Business, news stories, television. So it would be libraries in news stories. Maybe that's what I'm looking for. So you can continue through those. Um, and we'll look at what all those limiters are, uh, but it's a great way to just make it less. It's the easiest way to do a search. And you can click on each record to view some specifics. So one of the records I clicked on here um, was a photo. So I cut off here on my screenshot the title, but it's usually if it has a title, it's going to be up at the top. Um, then you have the date that they, the actual item was created. So in this instance, this was a picture that was taken in 1953 of a library. So the created date is 1953. So you have to pay attention sometimes to those different dates because there's the created date for the primary source, um, but there could be a created date as in a date they created the record. Uh, so that's just what that created date means. Um, there's going to be a preview of the image. If it's going to be a picture um, in the description, they're going to talk about where this was. Um, looks like it was at La Singa branch. Um, you see there the secretary is pictured. Uh, they list some of the people who must work at that branch. There is a title to this here talks about the reporter is also listed and the creator and then the partner the partner is where this image originates from because as i said before there's different libraries and museums that are the originators and they're just throwing everything into this database so this is from the california digital library So you have a view full item button here that you would click on to see the full picture. Um, it usually will open up on another tab in another page because it's going to open up within California Digital Library's website. Um, it's just kind of linking you there right away. And also, if we would continue to scroll down on the same page, they're also going to have the address uh, URL link also for you to go to. So if you don't want to go to it later, but you're just going to copy and paste it into a different uh, document, then it's, it's easy to do. You don't have to sit and click this and open up a million tabs. Um, so that's a really nice tool that they also have there. And before I did say that uh, you can make lists. So you can save items to look at later. And that is to the right of um, the information on the record. So if I would go back a page, you notice here there is a button that says add to new list. So here, if you would click on that button, um, it's going to pop up with a little window that says name your list. So here you would type in the title of what you want to create and then hit the create button. And then also, in the background of this image, if you notice underneath, it has uh, the word suffrage and it says three items and it has a little box there. Um, so what it's also giving access to is all the other lists that you might have made. Um, so I had previously created one called suffrage because um, there's a lot of, of items pertaining to women's suffrage um, within DPLA. And I could also, instead of saying, add to a new list. I could click on this box. It would check mark it and add it to my list that I had previously made. Uh, so when you have lots of other lists, it would all just kind of stack up there. And if you also notice too above that button is the word cite this item. So you would click that to get any of the citations um, if you're going to be using this in a way that you need to add um, citations to. Uh, they kind of give a, a general, here's what the citation could be, and here's all, most of the information you're going to need. It doesn't necessarily mean that the citation is always going to be correct, just because um, different things for different um, 
types of um, citing might change. So like MLA versus APA versus Chicago, all of those things do change sometimes. So um, I wouldn't take it for face value, uh, but it is going to give you most of the information you're going to need. There's also another way that you can access the lists. So up at the top, there is this list button. Oops. I always do that. There's my lists. If you click on my lists, this is where you can also create a new list or you can see the other lists that you've made and access it that way too. So there's many ways that you can get to those lists. We're just going to go across the top um, tabs here. So browse by topic. There are um, a few topics that they are showcasing every few months. And it's just, they change them out sometimes because it might pertain to the type time of the year or it's just um, they're running through everything. It looks like they might be going in alphabetical in the way that they're listing this. Um, but you can go ahead and click on the categories to go further in. When you click on a category, um, I clicked on women in science. So each topic will have subtopics within that topic. Um, so women in science, so they have education about women in science, botany, medicine, um, as you scroll down, there's going to be a few more. So when you go into those subtopics, then there's going to be, you know, articles and, and things within there. You can also browse by partner. So this is different resources across the United States that are putting their items into DPLA. Um, if you're interested, and only seeing stuff from like the Smithsonian Institution, uh, this is a way that you can know that all of the stuff you're looking at is only at that one place. Um, and they also give you the amount uh, so you can see, you know, who has the most. Uh, obviously, it's National Archives and Records Administration. And then after that, it's probably the Smithsonian. But make sure when you're searching it this way too that you do use those limiters that were on the left side of your screen uh, just to make it easier because that's a lot of, of things to go through. You'd be sitting there forever. Other than Browse by Partner, there's also exhibitions. So this is another way that you can look at topics where items have already been gathered up for you. Uh, within each topic, there's subtopics that include facts and uh, history and photos. Um, currently, they have 32 topics on exhibition. Um, and you kind of think of this as a museum um, display that you're going to. So there's going to be, when you click into one of the exhibitions, I clicked on here, Battle on the Ballot, Political Outsiders in U.S. Presidential Elections. Um, that's very... Uh, timely topic right now and uh, you know they're going to have an introduction there's going to have photos and other kinds of um, materials that they have photos of so physical items um, that are related to the topic and there's going to be information and descriptions but it isn't going to be as in-depth as if you were the one doing the research. So somebody else has already done the research for you and put it together. So like I said, it's like you're going to a museum and you're looking at a display at a museum, but you get to do it online. The other item across the top here, the next one is primary source sets. Uh, so this one is definitely one of my favorites. And possibly it's just because there's so much there that a lot of uh, people don't know about. Um, but this is a tab at the top. It's designed for teachers. Um, it also could be used for homeschooling um, or just general um, 
teaching children, um, your own children, not necessarily in a formal manner. It could be just extra stuff to help buffer what they're learning in school. Um, but there are lessons already put together and on certain topics. And uh, these also do work in conjunction with Google Classroom, which is a really great tool. because A lot of our schools are using a lot of Google products in their schooling with Chromebooks. So this is the main page you do have, you can search by subjects, uh, time periods, um, and then sorting through them. So I think for my example, I did click on the California Gold Rush. So when you click on a topic, this is the main thing that you're going to see. There's going to be the title, there'll be a, an overview, and then who it was created by, what the time period was, what subjects are covered in this topic and then you're always going to have the source set your additional resources and the teaching guide and then there's also the little box here important about citing your information and if you want to share this to google classroom or not So I'll show you in a bit here, but the teaching guide is the most important part, I think, for teachers, um, because this is where they have dedicated uh, lessons that have been created to the topics. So these include discussion questions that relate to the photos and information that are in the primary sources, and as well as class activities and worksheets for various teaching levels, so both um, primary and secondary education. And all guides and worksheets are available to print and are properly cited for your own use if you need to show those. So as you scroll down, you know, there's more discussion questions, then there's classroom activities. Um, the important part to get the worksheets is in this additional tool section. Um, so they call it document analysis worksheets or um, using your primary sources. So uh, the document analysis worksheets is where you go to get the worksheet. Um, and when you click on that, this is what you see. They kind of describe to you what their worksheets are about, and then they have them listed below for the topic that you're in. So on the left side is um, younger students, like primary, um, and then the right is intermediate or secondary. There's also some other educator resources and distance learning program tools here, um, if that's something that interests you as well. The last section of DPLA is called DPLA Pro. So the place that you go to get to this is in the top right corner of the, uh, the homepage of, of DPLA is just the words DPLA Pro, and you can click on it. This is a place where organizations can come together to work on projects and also to add their own information to the Digital Public Library of America. So there's always libraries adding their archives. Um, not every library has archives in that um, that they have historical items to bring to the table. Um, you know, we could do this ourselves um, eventually one day. Um, we haven't, nothing formal or anything, but any of the um, items we have for our local history room could eventually one day go on here if we wanted to put it on here so that it's accessible to everybody. It's also a place where you can get free ebooks. So, on the previous slide, I think, if you, I know it's hard to see, but there's um, stuff up here that says hub, ebooks, and projects. So, projects would be um, like if you want to put your stuff on here. Um, the ebooks is what we're going to look at next. And hub, I think, is about um, developers and um, networking. We're going to ignore that part. So for the ebook section, um, the first one doesn't apply to um, P3 
patrons. That one is actually for libraries to buy ebooks in the exchange that DPLA has. Uh, but the one that you would want to uh, pay attention to is explore the free ebooks. Uh, so here they have more than 7,000 free ebooks available for instant download. They're just in EPUB format. Um, so it's they put it in what they call their open bookshelf. Um, so when you click on it, this is what it kind of opens up to. And you have access to any titles that are on there. You don't need any kind of card. And you can search the shelf. So they have their editor picks. I don't know how often they change those picks, um, but they also have some for each uh, genre that they are showing for everybody that week or that month but then up at the top right there is a search bar where you can search for a specific book um, so this might be good to use if there's something that the middleton library might not have because it might be of age or of seldom use something that we might have um, gotten out of our collection um, this is also really good to use for um, items that are no longer owned by any publisher and they're, um, they're, they don't have any, any copyright issues so anybody can have access to it. Um, sometimes you can find those items, um, the full item has been scanned um, and you can find it on Google. Google has a, a program where they go through and, and scan books um, but not everything is on there. So this, this could be another route that you could use. And there is a help page for DPLA. So the help page, I believe, if it's not at the top right, it's down at the bottom. Um, but that's the, the link there for it. Uh, and there are other digital libraries uh, within our own um, area. The biggest one is the UW-Madison uh, Libraries Digital Co Collections. So they do have a section that is free for anybody to use. You don't need a card to be able to use it. Um, and they do have um, their stuff in DPLA as well. Um, and there's there's lots of others, but that's just kind of the main one that's, you know, close to us here. Um, that does a lot of a lot of the work. Uh, so let's go into live. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to stop share for a second. And I'm going to share my screen for Yeah, let's try that again. Okay. So I think you should be able to see it now. I'm gonna make this a little bigger. So this is what it looks like today, right now. So they have their uh, number of uh, items that they have on their site and that changes all the time. Uh, this is that main search bar. Um, you can hit browse by topic here or up at the top like I said. Um, they're always going to have stuff that they are promoting. So right now they have a virtual event um, that is tomorrow at 2 p.m. Eastern um, and it's Black Women's Suffrage to Black Lives Matter. Um, so they're partnering with Charlotte Mecklenburg Library uh, to present that and you just would register on that button there. So that's something that you can join. That is anything that's on DPLA um, is free. So don't worry about that. Um, so if that's something that's interesting to you, go ahead and look at that. Um, there are, as you scroll down, they have like their exhibitions. They just have another way that you can access it. Same with their primary source sets. They just have some information here too if you want to learn more about how you can use DPLA. Um, so if you're interested in like using it for genealogy and family research, they have some information there. Or if you're more of a scholarly researcher, um, they have a section there that can help you as well. We're going to go back up here to the top. I'm going to click on that browse by topic section just so we can see it all live. 
And definitely don't uh, be afraid if you have questions, you can uh, unmute yourself, ask me. You can also put it in the chat if you don't feel like unmuting yourself and talking. Um, some people don't like doing that since we're recording. That's totally understandable. Um, I keep trying to check the chat here every once in a while to make sure. Um, but I'm gonna click on this women in science one. So there's a lot of different topics they have here. Um, and they do tell you who, who this was curated by. Um, so you can always research that person if you want to see who they are, if they're an expert in this or you know what, what they've done in the past. It's always good to do when you're looking at resources. And let's click on education. So here they have kind of a little summary on the left side. And then I have all the different records. So depending on what you're looking for, you know, it goes through like it looks like these are articles, uh, books that have statistics, here's some pictures. I'm gonna click on this one. It says biology class at Mills College, a women's college circa 1900. So when you click on that record, like I said, you have kind of some of your main informations here, the date that this was taken, they think it was around 1900, but they also that would also tell me that they don't know for sure. Um, the description is that there are women students in Josiah Keep's class in the Nathaniel Gray Hall of Science at Mills College. Now they give you some subject titles, the location, and there's the URL for the image if you just want the URL. Um, here's the copyright status for it as well. If you want to see the item, you hit full item. Please let me know if you can't see that. Sometimes Zoom doesn't like to follow. I think you should be able to see it. It's a very old looking laboratory desk there does not look like what it looked like when I was in biology class. So if you want to explore more, um, this, so the calisphere.org is where it originates. So they do have other stuff that's related to this picture. Um, so that's really helpful. It's at the University of California. If I click out of that, I should be able, it should be a different tab, so I should be able to get back to where I was. Um, if I wanna add this to a list, this is where I'm gonna hit add to list. Um, here, let's see here, I could just, the topic that I clicked in was women in science. So I think I'm just gonna stick with that. So now I have one item in each of those. Um, if I hit my back button, I can go back to my main records that I was looking through. So the other way um, would be browse by partner that we talked about. So let's do browse by partner. So there are quite a few places um, that have digital items. I'm going to click on, let's see. Oh, 
Okay, let's click on Recollection Wisconsin. So in our limiters here on the side, I wanna go through those. So for type, that's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, subject would be, okay, so we're in something about Wisconsin, but maybe I want something about the United States Army in Wisconsin or Madison, Wisconsin or the Mississippi River in Wisconsin. Um, so those are always really helpful. There is a date section where if you're looking for a specific year, you can also do that. And you can update your search so that it reflects that. Uh, for location, oops. you know, they do have a bunch of different things in here. They have some cities in Wisconsin, but then they also have some other stuff. They do have language. There's quite a few in different languages. Um, if you're interested in who the contributing institution is, you know, if you're looking for something that is um, possibly related to the Wisconsin Historical Society, you know, you could click on there. Or if you're looking for something that's in relation to like Marquette or Milwaukee Public Library, um, you can also look at it that way. And then our main partner is Recollection Wisconsin. So that's just another digital um, partner that grabs the stuff from these other institutions. So let's click on one of these. Yeah, this one's University of Wisconsin Digital Archives. So it looks like this is, I think in so June of 1895, so if I say view item, it takes me to UW-Madison library system. That's just a picture of Gooseberry Glen. So here, it depends on the um, the place that it is originally from here, um, you can download the item. And then um, you would be able to print it out when you hit that download button. Um, not every source is going to allow you to uh, make copies of the photo in that manner um, to have, but um, when you access the full uh, item of the record, that's where you would, on that page, you would find it. It is going to look different depending on the website. Um, so UW-Madison's website here does look different than um, the previous one that we were looking at, which was what, University of California. Uh, we do have a question. Uh, why, when would we use this database instead of using Google search? Um, and my answer to that is going to be, if you are looking for something specific, um, Google is not always going to be able to get it for you because there might be um, things in the way that allow you to do that. Um, Google doesn't always have access into um, searching DPLA. That's something that, I mean, because they created DPLA to be its own database. Um, so the items from those places aren't, are only found in the DPL database. It's not gonna be through Google. So if you were specifically looking for something that had to do with, you know, like this is, what's the subject headings that we had for this? You know, some anything with nature in Kenosha County in Wisconsin, um, but you wanted it from a certain time frame. You may not be able to find it unless you actually go to this database.
hopefully that makes sense. It's just Google doesn't always have access to all the things that you think it should. Um, you know, this, this was created because there are things that are in archives that you don't have access to anywhere else unless you're actually physically there. So this is a way that you can kind of get past that. Um, it's still a very specific thing. It's still within um, libraries and museums um, and not, I don't know how to explain it. It's not giving the, the right of it to Google. It's still staying within those institutions when you use this uh, database. So next I want to show, let's see. Browse by partner. I need to make this smaller for a second. One of my little windows is in the way. Okay, so exhibitions. So I said earlier, this is, you know, like you're going to a museum and you're looking at something. So if you go to Race to the Moon, it does give you a little bit of a summary right away. Um, if you're into it, you can click on Explore Exhibition, and that's where you jump into the exhibition. Um, so first, there is the introduction with some photos. Um, you can click on the different pictures. You can zoom up, look back. And once you're done looking at all that, there's this next that goes to the next section. Um, if you notice on the left side, they also have everything listed in order. So you can click around instead of hitting that next button. Your choice. Um, so again, you have you know, access to What did I say? This is from the archives of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. So not stuff that you're necessarily going to find if you search it um, on the internet. Only if you use this database. Uh, once you're done looking at the exhibition, um, there is a little close exhibition link in the top right corner. And it takes you back to this page. Um, you can hit your back button. Oops, never mind. You can click on exhibitions. <laughs> back button doesn't do that for you. Um, like I said, there's 32 exhibitions right now. Um, they do change sometimes. So some of them they have had on here for, for quite a while. Um, I think this is one that they put up you know, they had all of the information and in, in things for it already, but once um, this pandemic started, everybody had been getting very interested in the 1918 influenza pandemic that happened in America. So they do have an exhibition for that. Um, you know, they talk about a lot of different things in here, spread, taking measures, impact. We're not going to go through that right now, but um, so lots of different things to look through. And I think the fun thing about this is that it's, it's already put together for you. So if you're a person who's not necessarily here to do research, um, this could be a way that you can look at something that's already curated for you. Um, that's, I think, the great part about DPLA is that it really is for everybody, whether you're there to learn something or if you're there to do research. Next after that is the primary resource sets. So there are a lot of topics and to kind of sift through them, you could go by subject. You could also go by time period. And then there's also, you know, what's oldest, what's most recent or what was most recently added. So anything new if you've kind of gone through a lot of it. So let's choose like, I don't know, 
migration. Let me do that. There's, you know, this this is stuff that would be um, pertain to genealogy. Um, that might be helpful if you're trying to learn about, you know, immigration from certain areas. Here they have Cuban immigration after the revolution, Mormon migration, Puerto Rican migration. So it's got a lot of different things. So if we click on immigration through Angel Island, and like I said, some of this, I mean, this is specifically made for teachers, um, but depending on whether or not you're a teacher, you also might just be interested in looking at it because you're interested in the topic. So the source set, so all of these are primary sources, um, meaning they're letters, photos, um, things like that where it's the first, um, it's the primary thing that you're looking at. It's not, um, a resource through secondary um, ways. There's also the additional resource section. So this is just telling you kind of where um, some of the stuff that was listed is found. So you can go and look at those resources to see if there's more. And the teaching guide. So this is where you have discussion questions and they're all gonna relate to that source set. Um, so, and then they also have classroom activities. They just kind of give you some, some great tools to go through. Um, for each source here, they have, um, you know, help tool, tools here on the side for analysis. You know, they're asking you, ask students to indicate what are the author's point of view? What's the author's purpose? Um, so it's giving you uh, points to start at in your discussion with students. Um, and then this document analysis worksheets area, that's what I talked about earlier. Uh, that's also really nice. If you scroll down, if I was looking for a map to show younger students, they have a map worksheet that kind of has to do with what we were talking about or photograph worksheets. So those are also really nice to have. And also I said you can share it to Google Classroom. So this is where you would do that. Um, and when you hit the site this set, that's where your different citation styles pop up. Again, they might be incomplete, um, but that is a general citation for it. And then there's the my list section. So that's where I can see, okay, so I've got a suffrage one, libraries and women in science. Um, there is more information on the website here, like about DPLA, if you want to see um, who's all involved, how this is funded, who gets the credit for it. Uh, if you have anything you, that you wanted to say to them, there's a contact us information area. Uh, there's also a news section. Uh, so this is where they talk about their different updates, their different events. So they have their virtual event there and it looks like they had um, earlier this fall, a few other things and some during the summer as well. Uh, because some of these might be virtual, you might still have access to those. Uh, so I would definitely check those out to see if there's anything that would be of interest to you. And then we also have um, that DPLA Pro that I was telling you about. So that is up here on the right corner. And here, um, you know, they talk about different ways that you can do this. So if you work for an organization that might be interested um, in working with DPLA, this is kind of where you would go. But the ebook section 
is where you would probably want to go as a patron of our library. Um, and there's the explore free ebook section. So there is some information about them, um, but browsing the open bookshelf is where we're going to go. So it looks like one of their picks right now is Poetry by T.S. Eliot. You know, some of the things you might be able to get elsewhere, some of it you might not. Um, so it really depends. But like I said, it is going to be a EPUB file. It's an immediate download to your device that you are on. It is, you don't need a a library card of any kind. So it's just really interesting to see all the different things that you can get. Um, they even have children's books in here, which might be um, really helpful for weird ones that you might not always see or ones that might um, even be in different languages. I don't know. They do have textbooks on here that could also be helpful for um, yourself or people you know. Some classics. Uh, they also have Spanish, French. This is one that I would like to look at. Um, I do speak French, so looking at some of this would be fun. And they do have a lot of other languages too. And they have curated some stuff. So they have things about like pandemics, um, stuff that's going on in the current um, political atmosphere. So some of that changes and some of it stays the same. If there's a specific title you're looking for, you can use the search box. So I'm gonna click on, let's see here, the Haunted Bookshop since it's October. Um, and this is what it looks like when you click in. These are the different versions they have. Um, the EPUB format is usually going to be what you would use. That's readable by pretty much every device out there. Um, if you have something that is more specific, um, they do also have that as well. So you would just click download. And it asks if you want to allow the download, and then it just immediately downloads to your computer. Um, so it's just really easy. Uh, again, it's just you know a small amount of items. I think it was 7,000 items that they have uh, in the bookshelf there. Uh, so not nearly as much as what we have available on Overdrive or Libby, um, but it is also a different, different kind of collection. So it's not exactly the same that you're going to get um, there. It's going to be more older things, uh, a lot of things that might be um, historically based or literary classics, things like that. So let's see, let's close this one. So I'm gonna go back. If you click on the icon in the left corner, you should be able to always get back um, or to the DPL main site in the right corner. If you go all the way down to the bottom, there is a section if you're ever interested in getting email about any general news um, or any of these topics here they have listed, you can sign up to get email. And since this is a free thing, um, there, they do have a donate button if that's something you're ever interested in. And if you have any other questions, um, they do have a frequently asked question here um, section and more about DPLA. So that is, in a nutshell, um, DPLA. Oh, it's a really great resource. It's something that a lot of people don't realize exists. Um, it may not be something that is specifically a part of our library, but um, it is available for everybody. Um, 
and like I said, eventually maybe we could always put some of our stuff and archive it and put it into um, the DPLA as well. Um, but it's a really great place that you can have more resources um, than what you currently have, especially when a lot of us are stuck at home right now um, and trying to social distance and do our part. This is a way that you can just continue to do your own learning, your own research. Um, I just find it really fun. I know I'm a lover of history, so this is something that I just like researching topics and looking at pictures uh, for no reason other than my own joy. So um, enjoy. Um, if you have any other questions, we can keep it open here for a few minutes. Um, otherwise, you are definitely welcome to leave if you have other things to get to. But thank you so much for joining me tonight. Could you um, go back to the um, to the, the web? Yeah, it was on the. You were talking about how to evaluate sources. I think um, how to there was something about oh, just like citations or say that again, please. Was it about citations or? No, it was in the. Um, you can go to the top. Um, I think it was the primary source sets, and there was the thing where you were talking about how um, you could evaluate a source, I think it was, or something like that. There were handouts that teachers could use and whatnot. Oh, yes. So that's within, like, if you go into each topic mm -hmm. uh, within the teaching guide. There is this document analysis worksheets. That was it. Okay. Um, so the navigation is the and it's in the it's in the low right. Okay. Yeah. So and then you have it's broken up between younger kids and older kids. Um, you know, when you're looking at like the poster, what do you do when you analyze? A poster. Gotcha. Um, so they have it broken up between different types of media, uh, which is really helpful because sometimes people don't understand that. Yeah. Um, <coughs> and the, the stuff for older students, I think, would probably also pertain to adults. Um, but this, you know, since uh, this is mainly used for teachers, they're going to obviously have that geared towards kids. Yeah. Uh, but, but yeah, anything on that side would also work for adults. Okay, very good. Thanks for the question. <clears throat> no, I, I appreciate that. That's very, very good. Oh, it's actually, if you Google that, that's uh, directly to that page. That's awesome. Great. Wonderful. Um, thank you so much. This was really interesting. Um, You're welcome. Yeah, it's a really great source that people don't always know is out there. <laughs> mm -hmm. it's, been, it's been around for quite a few years now, at least. I want to say at least four or five years, like, and in, in with it being really robust, like it is. Um, and they've changed it a little over the over time, but um, it's it's pretty much the the main parts of it are the same. So I have another question that's not related to this, but I see that there are three other people on, and I don't want to monopolize the conversation. So, oh. say, so is there anyone else that has any other questions? I don't see anybody unmuting themselves. So I teach at the high school, um, okay. and I am interested in doing, um, well, I teach in the Alt-Ed program, so I teach a little bit of all the four core areas, English, uh, English social studies, science, and math to a little bit lesser extent. And I'm interested in doing some research about um, Middleton specifically and the history of Middleton. And <clears throat> um, I understand it might've been a sundown town. So 
I'm wondering where I might find information about, about, you know, I, I know that the historical society has a walking tour and stuff, but I'm wondering where might I find information, particularly for about um, people of color in the history of Middleton? Yeah, um, you would probably have to contact them in in a different way other than that tour so like email mm -hmm. phone to see who who would have that information if they have anything that they've documented and archived um, you could also check um, with uh, wisconsin historical society yep. Um, yep. it would have a lot of um, ways to network to find those people as well um, I'm trying to think we have we have some like stuff of historical value um, that's going to be going in our historical um, room, our Middleton historic room that we were trying to get ready to um, to have for everybody and then the pandemic hit. so yeah. um, that obviously has been on hold because right now we're using it as a staff space so that we can all be socially distanced while we work in the building. Um, but we still have all that stuff. Um, I'm not sure what it all entails. So I'm, I, I don't know. Um, I can't give you anything specific that I know that we have. Um, but I have heard um, of Milton being a sundown town before um, from just discussions um, that I've had. So um, I would definitely probably start with the Middleton Historical Society. Um, okay. And, and try to contact uh, those who work there uh, to see what they would have for you, if they have anything that you can go through. Um, and then again, the histor the Wisconsin Historical Society um, is probably another good place. Okay, very cool. Well, thank you so much. This was really interesting. I really appreciate your time and um, I really, this was very, very informative. You're welcome. I hope this can be of use to you in your teaching someday. It's Absolutely. such a great, great tools. I, I talk to teachers all the time and they have no idea about this. So um, yeah, I don't even know if I'm going to talk to our librarian. I'm sure she knows about it. Well, I, I assume she knows about it, but I'll mention it. And then she's, she's excellent. Um, so I'm, I'm sure she probably, I imagine she probably knows this, but this is really a wealth of information. So thanks. You're welcome. Yeah, I mean, there's so many things out there that not everyone knows everything. I'm sure there's plenty of resources out there in the library world that I don't know about. <laughs> you can only fit so much in your brain at one time, I feel. so. Thank you. Have a good night. Yep, you're welcome. All right, if anybody else has any other questions, feel free now. Otherwise, I am going to go ahead and end our meeting tonight. Oh, all right. Looks like not. I'm going to stop my share and end our night tonight. Good night.